Welcome everybody back to Veil of Sound. It's a video interview Sunday as usual here. And we have someone on the show whom a lot of you will probably not know. I also only found out like a quarter of a year ago because he did a very, very interesting collaboration with someone that you all know, Mike Scheidt from Yop, uh, one of the personalities in our realm of music. I would like to present you James Romick. James, thanks for being on the show. Thanks for having me. So <clears throat> to clear it off, James is a, can I say neoclassical composer? Ah, uh, maybe. <laughs> so maybe you can say something about your profession. Maybe that clears it up a little bit. Sure. Um, I'm a composer of, of what I suppose we would call concert work. Music intended to be um, heard in a concert hall setting, although not this piece that we're going to talk about today so much. <clears throat> um, I suppose that a good term might be experimental music. Um, music that's trying to push boundaries and maybe do some things that are a little different and out of the ordinary, which I think is why it's such an easy collaboration with uh, Mike and with the, mm -hmm. the metal community where, where people are very comfortable with pushing limits, experimenting with things, seeing how things go. It seems to be a very open-minded community. I'm, I'm happy to be hanging out in it a little bit these days. So, uh, I mean, like, I know how people get into bands and I know how their profession evolves, but can you say a little bit, a little bit about how, like, let's say your curriculum vitae, how did you get into making music? How did you progress? Where did you study? Sure. Um, when I was a little kid, I played violin and piano mm -hmm. and, um, I was okay at it and I, I enjoyed it, but things really took off for me when um, around the age of, I don't know, 11 or 12, I spent my life savings on a drum set and started playing drums. And even though I was in a band and doing, doing the rock thing, uh, I also got into percussion in orchestra and band and, and started studying that seriously. So percussion became, became the thing. By the time I went to college, my undergraduate degree was in percussion performance. And at that time, I probably thought I was going to play in a symphony orchestra or something like that. Um, but at the time, and this was the, the early 90s, at that time, there wasn't nearly as much uh, percussion literature as there is now. And yeah, it's hard to believe because there's, there's so much now and so much great music. There were, there were classics, but uh, there was this spirit that percussionists, many of them, would contribute to the literature by writing music. So it wasn't unusual when I started writing uh, percussion pieces to perform with my colleagues at, uh, and this is at the University of Iowa, where I was an undergrad. So that's how I got into composition. And at the same time that I was really getting into composition, I was realizing that I didn't enjoy spending hours in a practice room perfecting my triangle technique, my tambourine technique, and all the things necessary to be a good classical percussionist. I, I enjoyed the rehearsals, I enjoyed the concerts, but I realized that I was probably never going to develop those kinds of skills that would land me in a, in a professional symphony orchestra. So composition seemed like a good way for me to interact with, with music and with the musical community. So that's where that switch happened. Mm -hmm. And you've been making music ever since professionally, right? Yeah. Or writing music, right? That's right. And now tell us, how did this collaboration with a doom metal guy happen? Yeah. Um, I became aware of Yob the way many people who aren't in the metal community learn about Yob. I, I read about them in either the New York Times or the New Yorker or somewhere about this band. And I was curious when I was reading about these 18 minute, 25 minute tunes that developed slowly. And um, in that way are very, very composed. And that's very similar to um, at least one of my musical interests, which is uh, what we could call just generally minimalism. Mm -hmm. Things that happen 
over time where we can hear changes happening. And this minimalism also goes along with, I suppose, capital M modernism, where one of the definitions would be that you can, you can see the way things are made. You know, buildings made out of steel and glass, as opposed to things hidden behind paneling or ornate woodwork or, or whatever. Um, this idea where you get to see see the structure of things. So I started listening to Yob. I found some things on YouTube. I, I bought some things on Amazon, and um, I really I, I felt something pulling me into this music. It was technical in a way that I appreciated, but it was always extremely visceral as well. And this appeals to me. My composition studies um, were with serial composers, names that you may or may not know, Charles Warren and, and Milton Babbitt. Um, and the idea behind this music, in the public at least, is that it's very strictly controlled. And if people listen to it too quickly, they could dismiss it as not having a heart. Of course, you realize after a while that things that are carefully constructed are, are filled with just as much heart and emotion as anything else. But superficially, there was this idea of uh, this constructivist kind of um, thing with art. And so I heard that in Mike's music, as well as lots of spirit, lots of heart, lots of freedom. So as luck would have it, shortly after I was getting into Yob, I was, uh, I was on tour myself. I was doing some composition things, and I was going to hear an orchestra piece of mine. And I was in between um, Bowling Green, Ohio, and Buffalo, New York. And my orchestra piece was happening in Buffalo, New York. But I stopped for the night in Cleveland. And Yob happened to be playing a show that evening. So I thought, well, I've got to go check this out. So I went to this show. And um, I was struck by the music was fantastic, of course. But I was also struck by the audience. The audience was filled with people who were very knowledgeable about what they were about to hear. There was no surprise. They were, they were fans. And they were um, very serious about the music. And it was clear that the people on stage were serious about the music as well. And so it reminded me of a, a new music concert that my music might be performed in, where the audience um, knows fully well what to expect when they're, they're going in. And they, they're bringing something to it, as well as the performers are bringing something to it. So uh, a day or two later, I sent Mike an email on Facebook, or a Facebook message. And I just said, you know, I saw your show. I've been listening to your tunes. I think they're fantastic. Um, I probably mentioned something about the commonalities I saw between what he does and what I do. And I uh, said something like, I just wanted to let you know that you've got a fan on the other side of the musical universe. And uh, he wrote back almost immediately. And um, I didn't know Mike at the time. If you're familiar with Mike, you know he has a reputation as being uh, one of the nicest guys around, as well as very serious about his art. So we quickly got to talking about music and composition. I asked him some questions about his pieces. He listened to some of my music. And um, before we knew it, we were 21st century pen pals on Facebook. <laughs> yeah. yeah. And when did the idea of really creating something together, when did that come up? We got together in Toronto, actually. I happened to be uh, there and he was on tour and we hung out. This was in 2018 in the summer. We hung out before the show and uh, chatted a little bit. And I think that's when we first started talking about this idea of maybe we could do something together. Mm -hmm. um, there was a lot of not wanting to step on each other's toes. You know, um, I wouldn't ask him to do something that doesn't feel comfortable for him. He wouldn't ask me to do something that doesn't feel comfortable for me. So we knew that our, our musical worlds intersected and overlapped significantly, but it took us a while to figure out where that would be and how that might work. Mm -hmm. And uh, there's anytime you're mixing genres, you also have to be careful not to do something that, that ends up being silly or self-indulgent for that matter. Yeah, nothing too show offy, right? And that is also, I think, a problem. Because, I mean, you've said that you are, in some ways, of course, multi instrumentalist, but I think, you know, playing on the electric guitar and trying then to convert the literature, the notes in front of you into what Mike then did is mm -hmm. something very different. But. <clears throat> 
what I would like to know is it is a commissioned piece of music, it's right. Um, I, I know I only know that from Roadburn in Holland. You know, I know they tell somebody to write something, so I know what a commissioned piece of music is. But who commissioned it this time? In this case, um, a commission can be a lot of things. Uh, in an ideal world, a commission is uh, a famous orchestra uh, sends me an email and offers me tens of thousands of dollars to write an orchestra piece, and then they perform it at Carnegie Hall, and then it's recorded and it wins a Grammy, and, and everybody's happy. That's the the ideal commission. In the real world, um, commissioning just means some sort of a commitment to the project. So sometimes it's monetary, sometimes it's a commitment to perform it, sometimes it's a commitment to record it. In the case with Mike, um, we had become friends at this point, and so I certainly wasn't going to ask him for for money, um, but we both had a list of things that we wanted to get out of the situation. I wanted to make a recording, and I was interested in pursuing um, a more pop approach, which is putting out the recording first, then thinking about performances later. That's not the way it usually works in, in my world, although I'm sure it does sometimes. But ordinarily, the piece is performed a few times, then you get a recording together and you put out a recording, and it's to remind people of the performance in the rock world or the pop world is the opposite. The recording comes out first, and then in many ways, live performances are trying to recreate the recording experience for the it's audience. It's vice versa, right? Yeah. Yeah. So I was interested in, in pursuing this. And, uh, you know, you'd have to talk to Mike about his list of, of demands. But I remember one thing he told me is that if I'm going to do this, I need to get something out of it as well. And I knew he wasn't going to talk about money. Um, and he said, what I want to do is I want to learn how to read your piece. Mike has a fundamental knowledge of reading music, but of course he doesn't do that on a daily basis. So he said, I want to, I want to learn some things. I want to learn some vocabulary so I can talk about my music more intelligently. I want to be able to talk about the piece that we're working on together more intelligently. And uh, this will be no surprise to you or your fans, but I mean, this is a very admirable quality that Mike has. Um, He's a real curious. hero musician in that way. Yeah. Um, so just a question, can I also imagine this commission thing being very close to somewhat of a classical songwriter in some ways? Sure. Um, and another thing that we can do when the piece is quote unquote commissioned is I can then apply for grants and things saying I've got this piece in the works and maybe somebody else can fund it. And uh, this did work out to, uh, I got a small research grant from my university to work on this. And uh, part of the terms of that was that Mike did a, it was on Zoom, thanks to the pandemic, it all worked out nicely with the Zoom. Uh, Mike zoomed in and met with my composition students at Western Illinois University, where I teach. So there was an educational component to it as well. Um, and I also used the, um, the mic piece as part of my application for um, a residency at Copeland House. Mm -hmm. Aaron Copeland, famous American composer, when he uh, passed away, he left his house to a foundation that invites American composers to come and stay at his house and work. So um, that's one of the places where I was working on Mike's piece. And I'm sure that the uh, being able to list that commission was part of the reason that I was able to to be invited to this this residency, so it was very nice. So, <clears throat> the title of the record or of the piece is "The Complexity of Distance," um, a title that, of course, I have to ask that: How difficult was it to work with someone who's three flight hours away from you? Right, um, that was definitely a challenge, and it was something we we discussed. Backing up just a little bit to talk about this collaboration, in addition to not reading music on a regular basis, um, Mike also doesn't play other people's music. Of course not. You know, we all we all do covers when we're in our high school bands, and then some of us become composers and some of us become rock stars. So when Mike became a rock star, he stopped playing other people's music. And he was telling me about his uh, Deep Purple cover that Yob did and how that's one of the few times he's played anybody else's music in, in many years. So, so that was an interesting thing too. As far as the distance is concerned, um, we knew that it was going to have to be something that I would work on and finish, and then he would work on. And in my 
my musical universe, that's not unusual. The composer finishes the piece, hands it to the performer. Uh, in many cases, the performer doesn't have much to do while the piece is being written. And then similarly, the composer is hands off once it gets into the hands of the, the mm -hmm. performer. So in Mike's case, once I delivered him the score, um, which was in uh, December 2020, he started working with a guitarist friend of his, and he actually took lessons once a week for a year and a half, uh, working on the score with, uh, with another person. And he would ask me general questions, but basically I told him I wanted it to sound like him. I wanted him to put his musical stamp on it as well. So it wasn't back and forth, but it was certainly a collaboration. Mm -hmm. The other thing is, of course, also that distance in music is a, a very interesting thing because when listening to the commissioned piece, it seems as if the distance between the two chords, of course, it's filled with reverb. How difficult was it for you to plan that part? Well, that was both the, the fun part and the scary part because I was, I was controlling what happened where. But then, as you say, the spaces in between, the distances, were filled with something um, more unpredictable than, than usual. Um, if I was writing for piano, say, the piano decay is predictable. Certainly lower notes take longer to decay and louder notes take longer to decay, but, but we know what's going to happen, basically. And it's not silence. There's still stuff happening in between the notes with piano. But with the guitar, there was a certain degree of unpredictability and uh, in fact, the dynamic change, things can actually get louder in between notes where that doesn't happen with, again, a piano. So this is where, where the magic happens. And it's also the part that I didn't control. So some of it was happenstance, some of it was Mike, um, as he calls it, riding the feedback, expertly controlling what's, what's happening with his amps. And in a recording studio setting, you can go back if it gets too out of control, but we definitely wanted it to sound like a, a human being playing an instrument in real time. Did you ever think about putting this out with an acoustic guitar? Because that then would, of course, be much closer to your normal realm of music. It would, and I'm sure it would be interesting, but some of the spaces would be so long, I would imagine that the acoustic guitar would stop ringing. So it would be a very different experience. Um, on the other hand, I suppose it would still do the same thing that that all music does. You hear something, you try to remember it, and you try to anticipate what's going to come next. Yeah, and we as and, listeners, we try to fill the gap, right? Yeah, yeah. And so leaving intentional long spaces like this, um, I hope invites a listener to participate. and. Um, in a way, acoustics and physics are participating in this piece too when we think about the feedback and the distortion mm -hmm. and, and how it behaves or doesn't behave after Mike does something that is very strictly planned out by the composition. Yeah, but of course, there is still that little bit of unplanning ability, you know, like you cannot control how he sets his amp. You can, you can talk about the tuning, but Mm -hmm. Did you influence the amp settings as well? Uh, what I told Mike is that I wanted it to sound like his signature sound. <clears throat> and obviously, if he's not playing his signature music, it's going to sound a little different. But at one point, I don't remember which one of us said it, but we wanted it to be recognizable to, to his fans and recognizable to the handful of people who are interested in my work as well as, as being, being ours. We'll come to that handful a little later on. <laughs> um, I have a question. I listened to one other piece that you advised me to listen to still, um, <clears throat> which I don't know, but in German, still means silent. Um, That's right. It struck me a little bit when listening to still and then again listening to the complexity of distance, I had a feeling as if I was listening to, to antagonistic twins. Mm. Because, yeah. of course, in the complexity of distance, there is no silence. In still, there are lots of moments of calm mm -hmm. and without notes. Mm -hmm. I'm pretty sure that was not a plan, right? No, although um, 
having the the one long piano piece, which uh, Mike was familiar with, and um, I think he likes it. That's that felt like it gave us license to do that. Um, this isn't the first time that I've taken an hour and and filled it with something. Uh, the two pieces are really different in one specific way, though, and that is that still progresses from from here to there. It goes through twenty four different pitches in groups of three, but it ends somewhere different than it began. And uh, jumping through it, if you skip ahead you know, every ten minutes or so, you're in a very different harmonic world. Whereas Definitely. with the complexity of distance with Mike's piece, we only have six chords in the entire composition. And then they they change when they interact, when they when they're in close proximity to one another, then adjustments are made. But it um, it really stays in the same place for an hour. And in fact it ends as it began with the same chord. Um, and Which makes so, it loopable, as I found yes. out. <laughs> Sure, put it on for six, seven hours. I had it on for free. <laughs> <laughs> but I, I to, to say it clearly, I, I did not have a feeling of not being, I, I had a feeling of being musically entertained in a positive way. Um, and just like you said, of course, coming from a metal background, you know, listening to, to stuff like that is not unusual for me. Mm -hmm. However, I, I had a feeling, you know, as if when you play this to your regular audience, mm -hmm. what do you think would the reaction be? We'll find the out. The Doom fans will love it. I, I can assure you. They, we will love that. That is clear. But your That's very kind of you to say. Um, <clears throat> I'm not sure what, what my community will make of it. And... Mm -hmm. Just like the metal community, I mean, th there are so many different subgenres and subgroups. Um, yeah, it's it's hard it's hard to guess. Um, yeah. There is plenty of of music, concert music as opposed to to pop music that is uh, static in some ways. Although though this is this is changing, of course. But there are things that do ask the same kinds of demands of the listener. Um, you're probably familiar with somebody in the middle, Brian Eno. Yeah, of course. Uh, with the ambient <laughs> kind of thing. In, in a way, this is a, an ambient piece. I suppose it could could fade to the background or definitely um, or come to the forefront. There's a composer named Eliane Radigue, a French uh, French woman who does things with synthesizers or did for a long period of her career. Um, the old-fashioned synthesizers with knobs where she would uh, have stores that would require her to play some sort of oscillating tone and then make micro adjustments to different filters and things like that over a long period of time. Mm -hmm. um, there's some beautiful YouTube videos of, of her twiddling knobs and looking at stopwatches and crossing things off pages. And she'd record these things directly to tape. So in a way, they're a, a performance. Um, but this is extreme drone, kind of like Sun. Um, Which we also had on the show a few weeks ago, but just saying ah. for all those who haven't heard those two podcasts still on our Spotify and on our on our um, YouTube channels. Mm -hmm. um, coming coming back to that, I have a question because you are mentioning um, musicians that uh, many of us, including me, would not have imagined um, a more classical oriented composer to listen to. Were those also like straight influences on the complexity of distance? I think that anything that we absorb becomes an influence. And it's for me, it's not usually a conscious thing. What I wanted to do was write a, a so-called process piece where I set something up <clears throat> and we let it happen. Mm -hmm. Obviously, the recipe has to be very fine-tuned to get that to come out right. But um, I wanted to set something into motion and hear it play out. And then I wanted to hear it with the, the timbres of one of my favorite guitarists playing his sound through his system. Mm -hmm. um, so that was, that was really the aim there. What also strikes me, of course, I mean, 
I love the title of, of the music because it's so ambiguous and there are so many layers of it. Because I also thought that distance is like a natural condition between people that are not family members or that are not related in any way. Mm. Um, was it possible for you and Mike to even further bridge that gap during this process? Did you become closer? Absolutely. Um, and that's one of the great things about it, that um, we, we've become friends. We've, uh, especially during the pandemic, yep. he was one of the people I talked to regularly. <clears throat> and we were talking on the phone, talking on Zoom, texting back and forth, um, not always about the piece. And I think that was important, especially before starting writing and starting working on it, just to get to know each other a little bit. Yeah. And um, we found right away that personally there were things that we could assume about one another that turned out to be delightfully true. We, uh, in addition to some musical sensibilities that we have in common, um, we share some views about how, how to interact with the world, how to treat other people, um, how, with the purpose of art, and so, so it was very comforting to get to know somebody um, who it turns out is, is really very similar and uh, somebody that I admire very much and just a, a thrill to work with. Mm -hmm. You've already mentioned the pandemic. Um, was this piece also some kind of outlet to deal with the pandemic for you and or for Mike? Absolutely. Um, Speaking for myself, uh, and the pandemic has been horrifying, of course, and everybody has been affected, ranging from inconvenience to just you know utter devastation. So I would never want to say that it's been a good thing. But in our case, um, we did try to make the best of, of the situation. And one thing that does occur to me is that with Mike not being able to tour for a year or two, he was able to dive into this project and he was able to take guitar lessons once a week. Um, so it's, it's conceivable that this project would have turned out differently um, or at a different time had we not had this, this ridiculous situation that we were all yeah. in. So I know that on my part, it gave me something to focus on. And in fact, I, I remember the composition of the piece vividly because I did a significant amount of the work in the summer of 2020 and my wife and I really like to travel so we hadn't been traveling since March and in June we uh, we went ahead and we, we drove out to Colorado where we spent a lot of time in the summers and we rented rented a place and we were there for a long time and we were doing the same things we were doing at home you know hiding inside talking to people on zoom take out food um, but it was in another location and I had this project to focus on. So it, it got me through. Which I totally can imagine. Um, I would like to talk about a few things musically because I found that really interesting. The first thing that anybody hears on the complexity of distance is a power chord. Something that I would have never imagined in a commissioned somewhat ambient slash classical piece of music. Um, <clears throat> is that something that you wanted to start off right with? Because the other chords that you use are not always power chords over the course of a, of a piece. Right. Um, there are six power chords that happen throughout the piece. And then any other chord are intersections of the two where, um, uh, two different power chords are combined in various, various ways. So the power chord, as your listeners and viewers know, is just a root and a fifth. Um, but once we take it through all that processing, we get all kinds of rich overtones and, and things like that. So it's not really just those two pitches. There's a lot more in it. And in fact, one of the reasons that power chords have evolved the way they have, um, I assume, is that because of the distortion, if there were added tones, that would create, um, it's funny to say this, it would create ugly distortion. Uh, too many things happening in those upper frequencies based on what's down below. 
So I definitely wanted to start with that sound. And it's also the familiar sound. That's the, that's not the only kind of chord that Yob plays, but that's, that's the sound of Yob, um, a chord ringing and a chance to hear all those interactions and those complex harmonics up above created by the distortion. Definitely. What I just thought was like, okay, is he really using something that is in a way representative of, I don't want to say hair metal, but like typically 80s metal. Well, again, like I said, our influences are our influences. So I grew up in the 80s and, uh, you know, I've, I've listened to my share of Van Halen. I, I, I didn't want to say Eddie, but it's like I, I thought that there is so much Eddie in there. I love that. I really, That's really a good do. thing, as far as I'm concerned. Definitely, definitely. I mean, like we're talking about one of the best guitar players of all times. Um, and I also love the way that you start right in Latin, you would say in medias res, right in the middle of things. There is no build up, you know, it's like here, this is my, this is our piece. That's what it's going to be like. Um, that is something that I really, really love because just like you say, if you did this whole build up thing, it would have been like, I don't want to say just another Yop song because there is mm. just not another Yop song. There are always great Yop songs. But it would be too close to what we usually or what we often hear from them. So I really love that. But something that you have to explain to our viewers and listeners, because I had a hard time understanding it. Um, in the essay that comes with, <clears throat> with uh, the piece, you talk about three different frets or stems uh, mm. in that piece of music. I know that there are, of course, moments when those stems or frets overlap. I guess that's also one of the very interesting things for you, right? How do those overlappings work? Mm -hmm. So, but, oh, yeah, go you ahead. First. No, you, no first. you first. So my question is, can you explain that thing with the three frets a little bit? Sure. Uh, these three threads, as you're saying, or strands, whatever we want to call them, really there are um, three pulses yeah. that happen throughout the piece. Um, and each one, one is one beat longer, right? Right. So um, there's something happening every 13 beats. That's one strand. There's something happening every 14 beats. That's another. And something happening every 15 beats. So you can actually hear that at the beginning when all three strands start together on just that giant chord. Yes. But then there are three chords in rapid succession after that. You know, 15, 16 seconds later, there are three chords. Yeah. Then... Um, there are three more chords and they're slightly farther away from one another. Eventually, these threads start to overlap. Naturally. Um, I know they're there. I know what pitches are attached to each one. And yet when I'm listening, I get lost very quickly. Um, I wouldn't expect anybody to be listening to it in terms of hearing that structure. But what that guarantees uh, for me as a composer is if something happens at each one of those strictly defined points, the distances, again, and we're talking about temporal distance this time, the distances between them change. And it changes at a, a regular rate, but not one that I perceive, perhaps because it's so slow. But what it guarantees me is that even though you could listen to it and say that it all kind of sounds the same, every, every moment is different. And the, the spaces between things are different, which is why if you're playing that fun game where you're listening to it, trying to guess what might come next, you might start to have a pretty good idea of what might come next, but then it might come in a little bit earlier or a little bit later than you expect it to. Yeah, and that is, of course, that one thing where <clears throat> you also take the listeners, the regular YAP listeners that you've been referring to, where you, of course, we all have an idea of what comes, but with this temporal diversity, of course, you give us also a piece of surprise, which is wonderful, I have to say. Mm -hmm. um, Thank you. And it also, of course, creates a certain kind of repetitiveness, yeah. uh, repetitiveness in, in different frets. Um, that is something very doomy in a way, right? Sure. Um, I'm attracted to that. Uh ritualistic kind of thing. Um, mm -hmm. uh, Mike knows more about this sort of thing than I do, but a, a mantra, 
um, it's a it's a concentration puzzle. And if you think about what it takes for for Mike to perform something like this, there's physical stamina, there's mental stamina, um, and there there's extreme concentration involved. And the reason that we're able to listen to it and enjoy it and get lost in it is because of the very assured performance by Mike, who clearly knows it inside and out and will, will take us on this journey. But it's, uh, it's certainly not as fun for him, or at least not fun in the same way, um, if he's playing it as it is for us to listen to it. Because he's, he's yeah, got a lot of thinking to do. So when you were writing this piece, how much did you have to think like a metal man? <laughs> well, I, I'm not even sure what that would entail. Um, what would thinking like a metal man be? Did you did you have to did you think like somebody from within the genre, like a doom metal guitarist or like somebody who follows this genre very, very closely and did you try to appeal, uh, not to appeal to, to take this knowledge from doom metal and put it like an umbrella over your work? Well, my experience with doom metal was mostly Yob, and I don't know if Sun is considered doom or drone or what genre Sun would be in. Some, somewhere in the middle, yeah. By the time I was writing this, um, I was listening to Mirror Reaper by Bell Witch. Very good uh, album. Yes, and uh, of course, quite a lot longer than, than my piece. 26 minutes. 26 minutes longer? 26. Okay, they win. Um, n nerd, nerd, number one. Yeah. <laughs> um, but for me, rather than thinking like, um, like a metal composer or a metal performer, I was thinking about what I liked to hear. And I liked the one of the things that attracted me to Yob was strictly timbral. I liked mm -hmm. the, the the sounds yeah. and the warmth and the uh, the crunchiness and the ability to listen to a long tone and get inside it and walk around a little bit and explore. So that's what I wanted my piece to generate. Mm -hmm. And so again, this, this structure, this 13 against 14 against 15, doesn't really do anything by itself that's special, but what it does is it creates these spaces and it creates a structure where as it unfolds, all three strands don't come back together again for about an hour or 57 and a half minutes. I can nerd right with you. Yeah, yeah, of course, cool. I love that. <laughs> I love that. Um, coming away a little bit from the piece itself and a little bit more toward you, because I also want our audience to know that we are not talking to anybody but we are talking to somebody who was nominated for a pulitzer prize mm -hmm. take us through that a little bit i mean like i know that i only know i only know pulitzer prize from literature i didn't even know that that was one for music so to speak ah. um how must we imagine that process do you when do you hear about your nomination when do you hear about the result the uh... how did that happen for which piece Tell us uh, it, was, it was for Still, the piano piece you mentioned before, um, which is an hour long solo piano work. And um, the, the process is very simple on my end. Nothing happens. Uh, nobody tells you that you're nominated. Uh, there are no, it's not like the Academy Awards where there are nominees before, before the winner. Just one day they announce here are the three works that were nominated, and this is the one of the three that was was the winner. Mm -hmm. And they don't even call you. They assume that uh, somebody will find out and let you know. So I was sitting in this very room, actually, and this was in, I guess, spring of 2019. And um, I got a text from the lead singer of my high school rock band <laughs> saying congratulations on being a Pulitzer finalist. And that was the first I had heard of it. So I quickly checked the internet. And sure enough, there was a, a website on the Pulitzer thing listing um, listing the three pieces that were were selected as nominees. And uh, mine wasn't the winner, but it was it was on the page. Definitely. Uh, I should so, also mention that so, that same year, Aretha Franklin was awarded a special Pulitzer citation. So 
uh, in addition to being very happy to be on the page with composers Ellen Reed and, um, oh my goodness, I'm blanking on his name. Oh, I'm so I sorry. Was only in I was only interested in the fact that you were nominated. That yes, anyhow, to be on the page with Aretha Franklin was a real thrill. Yeah. Um, but just to make it clear, you, they, they um, nominate pieces of music. They don't nominate right. performances, right? That's right. And forgive and, my, my mental slip, I just remembered Andrew Norman is the other composer, a brilliant composer. So he was on the page too, mm -hmm. with Aretha Franklin. Yeah, and I think for all of you, for all three being on the page with Aretha is like... Of course, it doesn't get any better than that. More or less, yeah. Um, That's rock and roll. If, if you are nominated, do you... Is, is there only like this re respect for Loco, you wrote a re really, really good piece and we love it? Or does there also come anything with it, like a little bit of money, a little grant here or something like that? Uh, I got a letter from the president of Columbia University. Mm -hmm. Which and you know, That's and it. as I mentioned one more time, Aretha Franklin. Um, <laughs> we cannot mention her enough. That is totally. But it, it's it's an interesting thing because um, obviously this isn't the goal when one creates a piece of music. Uh, it's very nice recognition, but it's uh, it's not it's not the end of anything. It wasn't it wasn't a plan. Uh, so it's very nice, and it's nice if more people get to hear the music. And it's nice if it gives me more opportunity to to talk to people like you. Um, this is one of the nice um, nice results. I mean, apart from that you have mentioned growing up in the 80s and having had your fair share of metal and loving Aretha Franklin, um, <laughs> who are your favorite artists to listen to? Old or new? Hit, hit us up with two from each side. <laughs> well, um, I think most of the most of my metal experience growing up was through more proggy metal. Mm -hmm. So King Crimson was huge for me. Um, Rush, Pink Floyd, Genesis. Um, but the Genesis with Gabriel on the mic, right? Sure, all of it though, uh, because of course in in the eighties, Peter Gabriel was his own thing. Yeah. So I was yeah. I was listening to Genesis and Peter Gabriel separately before I realized that I could go backward and hear them together. Mm. Um, Metallica was starting to get big when I was in high school. Um, I started listening to Tool when I was in graduate school. Mm -hmm. So that was that was my entry into metal. Now I have to ask that, as you mentioned, Tool. When you listen to a band like Tool, or also to other prop metal artists do you automatically think of a musicianship that is behind it which is of course mind-blowing in many many ways or do you enjoy it just as pure music um, both hmm. and at this stage in my musical life i i'm not really separating the two mm -hmm. i i feel like I feel like both things things are good, but I do find myself drawn to, um, I guess I'd say music that's, that's better than it needs to be, mm -hmm. where if I wanna dive in and look for more details and look for things, there will be more rewarding things under the surface. Mm -hmm. Obviously there needs to be some sort of initial attraction that pulls me toward a piece of music, but I do find that I, that I like it if I start looking underneath rocks and, and finding treasures within the music. And that's something that I love about Yob, something I love about Tool, and something that I aspire to in my own music. Mm -hmm. Something like finding the Easter egg, right? Yeah. Awesome. So we come to our infamous quick fire questions round. And okay. as everybody who listens and watches us knows, you get two alternatives. You have to choose one of them and maybe give us a short explanation. We start up, uh, off with something very easy. Steve Reich or Philip Glass? Uh, Steve Reich. Okay. <clears throat> I know you live in the Midwest or in, in Chicago very often. Um, mm -hmm. So I have to ask LA versus New York. Uh, New York, but only because I have a lot more experience with New York. Mm -hmm. um, you said you started out with learning the piano and the violin. 
So violin versus piano, which one would you prefer nowadays? To play or to listen to? Either. Um, well, they're, they're, they're both integral instruments. My wife plays piano, so uh, we hear a lot of piano uh, in our house. In fact, uh, my wife, Ashley Mack, was the pianist on the uh, still recording and uh, performances that we've been talking about. Cool. So I'll, I'll go with piano. Cubs versus White Sox. Cubs. Okay. For me, it's <laughs> neither, so I don't care. <laughs> um, teaching versus writing. You know, I'm going to have to say 50-50 because I, I don't think I could do one without the other. I, I really enjoy teaching. And um, me too. I think if I was doing <laughs> writing all the time, Mm -hmm. I think it would be too much. And I think if I was teaching mm -hmm. all the time, it would be too much. So the, the two really feed one another. By the way, how did your students react to, to a conversation with Mike? They were very excited to meet Mike. Um, a few of them were fans already. And by the time the seminar rolled around, I had shared some links with them on YouTube and they were all fans by the time yeah. he arrived. And as you can imagine, he was, he was gracious and helpful and, uh, and thoughtful. So we had a, a nice hour and a half with Mike. Mm -hmm. for your own personal concert experience where you don't have to perform or anything concert mm -hmm. hall or a small club well, it would depend on the kind of music but I, I do like a good concert hall okay Van Halen or David Lee Roth solo oh Van Halen <laughs> deep dish pizza or Italian style pizza Ooh, that's hard. Um, Not for me. I'm European. I, I, I'm not <laughs> clear where. I'm going to go deep dish because I did grow up a little bit in Chicago and because uh, we make deep dish here at home. Last one. Okay. A little musical history question. Motown versus Stax. Ooh. Um, I'll go Motown. Okay. James, thank you very much for spending those 45 minutes with us. Um, I hope that now everybody knows a little bit more about your profession, about you yourself, and everybody will go and check out The Complexity of Distance, which will be out on New World Records, right, in a few weeks, if I remember. That's right, correctly. on June 24. So, June 24, people, you know what to listen to. So, thanks for being on the show, James. Thank you for having me. It's been a pleasure.